I would say that Egong is, you know, the bridge mindfulness system is very broken into pieces that are very digestible and, you know, very logical in their order for the most part. Uh, the Egong training kind of just jumps right into our topic today. So there's not a lot of background because I'll have other things for that. So, you know, eventually these 20 topics will be a book. So if somebody really wants to get into the, the nuts and bolts of what we're doing, you know, that book is perfectly available. Um, but if somebody's looking to just dive into the practice, that's a different book. Both will be available at a certain point. So, you know, there's plenty of opportunity to learn the nuts and bolts, but also do it. Uh, in doing it, though, we do have to pretty much jump into today's topic, which is the trick of emphasis. So just a quick recap. In the first topic, we did the, the human imbalance, and the human imbalance is the overall volume of thought. The amount of thinking that a person is engaging in from the time that they go, the time that they wake up from the time that they go to bed is astronomical. I mean, it's in the, I don't know, percentile, but it's pretty high. The nemesis is a mind that is operating below the threshold. I am no longer using the word level. Uh, if I slip, I'm, I'm probably going to be very aware of it, back it up, and then say threshold. So it's a threshold of below or above active recognition. We would sometimes call that conscious awareness. Aware that we're aware. Aware of the direction of our mind. Aware of our thoughts our actions, our emotions, and eventually the unseen. We can be a little bit more aware of our energy body. So that was the nemesis. I distinguished knowledge, intelligence, and wisdom in the third topic. Knowledge having three primary parts, information, personal experience, the experience of others. It's very conceptual typically very language-based, number-based perhaps even, if it's geometry or arithmetic. Uh, wisdom is when we remember our intelligence in the moment, or excuse me, we remember our knowledge in the moment and we act upon it. That's wisdom. Wisdom is an action. It's something that we're doing. I can't share it. I can't really, you know, and in sharing wisdom, I'm just sharing my experience of when I remembered. So that could be useful to you in the form of knowledge, but it's not wisdom. When you remember it, you act upon it, you have crossed that bridge between knowledge and wisdom. Intelligence is the fabric of the cosmos. So it is the underlining aspect that causes atoms to coalesce. It causes things to move in a geometrical way. The way that it's moving is often referred to as the Tao. So intelligence, the way that I'm using the word, is the underlining fabric of the cosmos. That underlining fabric is in every single cell of our body, our DNA. We are it. Uh, the fourth topic was the first core of the teaching, which is establishing presence. That's really where Egong starts. Egong starts with establishing presence and uh, the trick of emphasis. So it's really focusing on those two together. Not maintaining emphasis because that's counterbalance, but we'll talk about that next week. So establishing pres presence is that first core. In Egong, it's from the very beginning intended in advance. It's also, I'm telling you what to do. So I'm giving you specific, deliberate points of attention to develop them later in the practice. If we start developing our bubble of perception now, by the time we get to the later phases of the practice, hydrostasy, your bubble of perception will be very profound. It will be far more pronounced than if we try to start it then. So a lot of the tricks of attention that I'm doing in the very beginning of Igong will lend to what, we're, what we could potentially be doing in the hydrostasy practice. Does that make sense? Easy peasy. Okay. The voice of power, we kind of got a little sidetracked last week. We didn't we didn't discuss it quite as much, but it's definitely been something that we've discussed a lot. The voice of power in the beginning. Shana's like, this is stupid. I'm out of here. Uh, the voice of power in the beginning, especially in Egong practice, starts out with mantras. And per, which is what we would call productive self-dialogue. So it's mantras and telling ourselves true things, 
writing things down. Um, I would say that a quote isn't always a mantra because sometimes quotes can be a little bit long winded and it can be a little bit difficult to memorize that. If you memorize it, then you turn your quote into a mantra, which is cool. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I, I could see those being a little bit different because a mantra, there is no spoon compared to six sentences of a quote that you find inspiring. But writing down your quote, taking it with you, is a part of the Egong practice, and it's a part of productive self-dialogue, and that's when the voice of power begins. Another form of productive self-dialogue that I don't think is focused on nearly enough, especially in the beginning, maybe even true to this group and uh, you know, folks who are going to watch this on the replay, is talking your practice to yourself, talking it out. One reason that people really love guided meditations is because somebody is talking it out for them. It's guiding them through it. Well, here's a spoiler, uh, maybe a newsflash. You can do that yourself. You can talk yourself through your practice as you do it. Sometimes when I'm walking down the sidewalk, I'll remind myself, CV17, make sure that's square. CV6, below CV17, do 20, golden line. I'll remind myself of these things and I'll just say it. And I don't view that as repetitive, habitual, and not making me feel well, because it's not. It's not repetitive. It's not habitual. And it does help redirect me back to my practice and feeling better. Therefore, I view it as a form of productive self-dialogue. Substitute dialogue is also a, a way that we could look at the voice of power, but that is listening to somebody else. Uh, it could even be reading or something like that, you know, because then you're 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 reading those words and they're going through your mind and that's substituting thought for thought. Now, the overall goal is to reduce the overall amount of thinking. But just like we were talking about with Ida and the seated meditation, we can warm up to that. We're not trying to instantly go from uh, monkey mind at 500 miles an hour to zero. That's not reasonable. It may be possible, but for the vast majority, it's not probable. So there may be uh, a, a select few who are just like, oh, you know what? I don't want to think anymore. And they just turn it off. I wasn't that way. I had to practice for years. Does that make sense? Okay, so that was voice of power. That was last week's topic. And then today we're getting into the second core of the teaching. And also another one of those things that is unique to this practice so I still have not run across a practice that talks about emphasizing in advance and maintaining emphasis on your selected point of attention throughout the day. There is still nothing that I've come across that is delivering it in that way. Eventually there will be, I'm assuming, or there may be already that I just haven't come across. So I just haven't been introduced to it yet. Um, because I don't really introduce myself to a lot of stuff. I'm I already got a full a full thing to do throughout the day, so I don't really have a lot of extra time for exploring other people's teachings. And it's not that they're they're bad or anything. I'm sure they're fine. None of it is what I'm doing. So um, sometimes things can be a little bit helpful, and that's great when it comes across. But I'm not really diving into that kind of stuff. I have a limited amount of words that I want to go through my mind in a day. So I have to be very selective of when I allow that to occur. Work, conversations with people I care about, my own writing, classes like this, that's taking up a vast majority of my uh, the amount of internal self-talk that I'm willing to allow because I also want my overall volume of thought to be reduced. It has to be, otherwise I'm not doing my own practice. All right, so that is everything that we've talked about so far. Today will be the trick of emphasis. Um, any questions about anything so far? Does this all make sense? Pretty simple. The topics are going to get juicier, I promise. As we get away from... As we move past the things that we've been talking about for the past four or five years or so, we'll start to get into other topics that are, you know, maybe a little bit more cutting edge for us. But um, I don't think it's not juicy. I oh, think good. It's, I think it's all juicy. Um, I do still um, um, read other things and listen to other people. 
and I was reading, um, I read actually quickly, <laughs> The Seed of the Soul the uh, night before last, and um, which is, uh, it, and I find that there's a lot of parallels in what we talk about, and it's, and there's just different ways of saying the same thing, and I find it valuable, but you're right. Um, you know, uh, he, he was talking about becoming aware of, becoming aware of, but nobody really tells you how to become aware of. <laughs> um, so a lot of the, he's very principle based. So a lot of the same principles apply and that's helpful. And all of this is um, foundational stuff to keep going to what you are alluding to being more juicy. Um, but I find that if you don't, uh, reviewing it now, as opposed to when I first heard it years ago, and, and it was delivered a little bit differently, but it was the same stuff. Um, there's really nothing new. It's it's a, the same stuff that we've always discussed. It's just cleaner and it has more organization to it. It There's still value in the beginner. I can see where I've skipped steps and I can see, well, I just have a greater understanding how one builds upon the other and the feeling associated with it so that yes i when i realize that i'm not doing it i can i can do it much more quickly but the process is exactly the same it's just happening more quickly it's like stacking up uh, blocks you know and they they can stack up quickly you know it's like there it is but um reviewing it has really helped me to do that more efficiently so i I don't think it's not juicy at all. I, I have no issue with starting at the beginning again because it. I see it through a different lens every time we talk about it. So it's great. Maybe juicy wasn't the best choice of words because then uh, we all started to say that word and it just, yeah. But that, that makes a lot of sense. So now Egong is going to mix the first two cores right away with establishing presence using the trick of emphasis. Here's the subtle difference. There could be another practice that somebody creates someday that has these a little bit more distinct. Establishing emphasis or coming back to the present moment, establishing presence doesn't necessarily include points of attention intended in advance. Not necessarily. So there could be a way of looking at the bridge mindfulness practice where we really just focus on coming back to the moment. In fact, that's kind of how we did it as a group. There was a whole lot of here I am, where is my mind, go back to the moment, and so on and so forth. I really think that the two being introduced together is optimal. I think it's it's in terms of information, they can be in introduced separately, but really, really comes to doing the practice, the points of attention need to be intended in advance. And that's really what I mean by learning to establish emphasis, the trick of emphasis. So we can't establish emphasis or then eventually maintain emphasis without first being present. And when I use the word active, that implies that we're present that it is a part of the present moment. So active recognition means that you are recognizing it presently as it occurs. There's an active element in the present moment that you're aware of. This isn't conceptual looking back and, and things like that. That's something different. So when we use the word active, active recognition, we're talking about present moment, active alignment to the present moment. So we're aligned actively, and active implies that we're doing our practice. That's a doing word, active. Does that make sense? So establishing presence is the establishing of the word active. And if we were learning this in a classroom and in a, more of a, a verbal word, what am I thinking of, mm -hmm. a, a academic setting, these two could be delivered very separately. The idea of establishing presence and the tricks and uh, the trick of emphasizing in the present moment. Because when I say the trick of emphasizing, I fundamentally mean points of attention that have been determined in advance, not trying to wing it throughout the day. 
Uh, if you're trying to wing it, then you're definitely not doing egong practice. You're doing whatever you want to do, and good luck. I think it could be successful for you. I mean, if the principles are there, I don't know. You could arrive at the exact same location. I don't know about the timing and, and everything. You know, I would have to evaluate a variety of different aspects, but ultimately you can get to the same place doing it slightly differently. Egong practice jumps straight in with establishing presence using the trick of emphasis. So it's, they're together. Does that make sense? So the trick of emphasis is learning to emphasize aspects of your present moment deliberately, intentionally, and because your mind isn't habitually used to doing it. Now, in Egong practice, I talk about places of power. I talk about objects of power. Places of power are going to be locations and Donna would use the phrase, perhaps the lowest hanging fruit, walking along the beach, you know, walking along Lakeshore Drive in Chicago. These are places where it's just a little bit easier to maintain your points of attention that you have determined in advance. That's okay. Eventually, you know, throughout the practice, you won't need that. You can still enjoy it when it occurs, and that's all good, but it wouldn't be in absolute necessity for you to have a place of power to do your practice. But there's a lot of things that we do in the beginning that we may not have to do later. We still can because this is a layering practice, but we don't necessarily have to anymore. Does that make sense? Substitute dialogue. I don't have to do that. I don't need somebody else's thoughts in my mind to substitute for mine. But I still can, and it's okay. When I listen to audiobooks or something like that, I can, because of course I still do review. I'm not really reading new things. I'm not trying to gather uh, information personally, but I do continue to learn from the things that I've read and listened to already. Uh, it's about being um, okay with yourself without any outside input. Yes? Uh, what do you mean? I'm not sure what you mean. Being, um, being left on your own in a, say you were put in a prison cell with this practice, we could probably handle it better than somebody who needs all the outside stimulus like television, mm. people, conversations, whatever. So I would, yeah. What, what you were saying there was like, you don't need to be walking on the beach as a place you don't need to be in your you, you don't need circumstances mm -hmm. i know exactly what yeah. you're saying i was thinking yeah. i was thinking the same exact thing when when ernest was talking about it so much so that i wrote it down even though i've heard it a million times um because you're not in the habit of doing it i was in brooklyn yesterday um to see my nephew and 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 his wife and and the two babies and um, for, for me, children, babies, especially young ones, they are so present moment oriented that, that um, I enjoy so much being with them because I watch them um, being present moment oriented and populating their bubble of perception and all the things that we talk about and how that's how they exist. They're, they don't need to be reminded because their filters are, are, are their lenses are clean. Um, they don't. They don't have a lot of accumulated crap from our culture yet. They're de they're developing it because we're enforcing it on them. But and they copy things. But I found that when I was with them, it was very easy. Just like walking on the beach, it's very easy to stay in the present moment because they are, and it's easy to align with that. But I needed to remind myself during that talk because I was relying on their input, their energy, their practice to to keep me present. And it was my observation of them that got out of balance. Um, I was relying on my outside circumstances and I needed to remind myself, where's my feet? Where's my breath? I was I was present. I was fully present with them. Um, 
and mostly because I don't see them often and and for all the reasons I just stated being with children but I wasn't actively practicing because my points in advance were disappearing they were be I, I forgot them because I was so present I didn't need them and when I remember them um and I am practicing it's a whole it's a completely different depth and um uh, my bubble of perception is is um more populated and and the practice is uh maintaining emphasis actively i'm actively doing it i'm not relying on the outside otherwise it's just like you said when you began the explanation ernest it's um well you could just wing it but good luck to you <laughs> because i i would find that if there was an emergency i don't know how elegantly i would have responded Responded or less, definitely less elegantly. I, I can't say an emergency because I'm really good in emergencies. But if something else distracted us from that, um, and and my practice, where would my practice be if the children, you know, it would disappear because I wasn't actively maintaining emphasis on points of attention that I had chosen in advance because I was a I was allowing myself to rely on the outside circumstances to provide them. Is that something like what you were saying, um, yeah. Ida? Is that, is that what you meant? Yes. Um, there's a different feeling to being in, in your practice and watching the outside world or communicating with others in the outside world to clicking back into your practice when you realize that you're out of it. So having it in advance is like um, a safety net. It's like you're always being held. You know, that sort of thing. Yes, I, I don't think I was a, out of my practice, but I definitely was winging it. <laughs> I I was present, but I, my points in advance were not weren't there necessarily because I I it was like um, coasting. I I wasn't actively. I, I was present because the circumstances were so easy to focus upon to keep me present, but I, I wasn't anchored there because I wasn't, I, I had dropped the points of attention that I chose in advance. Maybe you should have chose the children in advance <laughs> as your point of attention. Cheater. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, Ido, if we go back to the prison cell example, there's two things that will start to come up the closer that we get to the later phases of this, of the, the, late, the later layers of this practice are freedom, the freedom to, you know, engage in those things and be in a prison cell and still feel free. That's freedom. And adaptability is our ability to enter situations like that and we maximize, we move and we grow and we continue even if it's not an ideal situation. So those two factors definitely should become more pronounced as we move along in the practice. One thing that we will talk about at a certain point as we you know, move through the practice also is something that I call deliberate folly. Don Juan called it uh, controlled folly. I'm not a big fan of the word control. So I use the term deliberate folly. And it's a way for a person to maintain their freedom, their adaptability, and their practice while still interacting with the outside world, which can get a little bit tricky because I can't count how many times that I don't really, I'm not really interested in the world around me. I'm just not. Um, it is what it is. And for example, a person who's thinking all the time insists on talking all the time, and I just don't need to. So deliberate folly is a way to kind of cross that bridge and it's not necessarily deceptive you know but it is it is a type of act in a manner of speaking uh, but we'll talk more about deliberate folly much later it comes more into the warrior training part of the practice because by warrior training we're probably noticing that our minds are no longer moving the way that the world around us is less just and this is just it's inevitable. You know, there's no getting around this because we're creating a very different island, one that's not distracted, 
one that's, you know, not ignoring the world around us. So the enemies of knowledge aren't our enemies on this island of presence, mindfulness, deliberate attention, choosing how we want to feel, processing new memories, and then learning how to adapt. And adaptability means even learning how to adapt to the enemies of knowledge and our four destroyers. Uh, can't really adapt to the fifth destroyer, but our output automatically affects that. So it is what it is. So the trick of emphasis will just kind of, uh, I'll tie it into the Egong practice. In Egong practice, I, I kind of give, we start with the four directions, and then I give, where should your attention be in these four different directions? We start with basic body awareness, and we'll build on that as we go through the Egong practice, but we start with our feet and our hands. That's easy. You know, everybody can at least look at their hands and feel it. Most people can easily feel their feet. I don't necessarily think the Dantian is the best place to start in the Egong practice, but it will come up really soon in the practice. It's not very long before I'll mention the Dantian, especially when we start combining Egong and Qigong. Qigong is movement. You know, we're going to do it in a very formal type of way. Egong is 100% informal. So fox walking is an egong practice because it's an informal, formal, informal. You can do the fox walking with every single step that you take. You can also do a formal fox walk that is going to be at three o'clock today between three and five. And you're going to walk for that amount of time and do your fox. So it, almost everything can be formal, informal, um, if that makes sense. But the egong practice is fundamentally something that we take with us throughout the day. So if we look at our four directions, human beings, most, and intention is almost directly connected to the dominant sensory perception. In the common human experience, and we all qualify for this, our dominant perception is sight. That may take a second to register or agree with, but look at it throughout your day. Look at how much you are sight dominated. Now, if you were born blind, you would be something else dominated, and your intention would be fundamentally aligned with that particular sensory perception that is most dominant. And then when attention is with that intention, before you know it, we start to see some triangles that comes later in the practice, such as desire, intention, and will. A lot of people who aren't, well, a lot of people who aren't practicing this practice, because there's... 7.8 billion people who are not practicing this practice, but this practice eventually will make you very privy to desire. And if you're not aware of your own desire, two things will happen. You'll have a lot of desires and the strength of those desires will be very strong. And if it's below the, the threshold of active recognition, those are fundamentally influencing your intention. And then it will fundamentally influence your will. And if you're not aware of it, if you're not used to paying attention to yourself like we are in this practice, cognitive attention training, behavioral attention training, sensory attention training, a person can be almost completely unaware of their own desires. And then there can become hidden desires that they're either not aware of or they're just not communicating to other people. And those hidden desires end up being a part of their intention and will dynamic. Does that make sense? And this is something that I see in the world. I see it a lot. I see it in very subtle ways. You know, a little compliment here or there, you know, what are we really doing here? You're trying to manipulate me. You're trying to reel me in so that you can, you know, have your way, that type of thing. Um, but it can also be in more uh, grandiose ways. America, there's a lot of uh, grandiose examples of attempts to subtly manipulate. And the manipulation factor comes in because the desires are so many and so strong that the person is below the level of active recognition charging that triangle of desire, intention, and will. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. It's just that when you first started talking about it, I was thinking in terms of self and when I do it. 
and when I can feel myself do it. And then you gave yes. examples of other people. And so my, my brain got a little scattered uh, because I was looking at it differently. Yeah. But um, I can tell when any one of those things are uh, out of balance, you know, uh, I can feel the pull of it. And, and then I'm surprised by my own, or I think I have a desire for something like that would be nice. And, but it's, and then I recognize when I'm balanced, when my practice is active, um, I, I can recognize that those desires might be something from the past or something habitual or something societally imposed, if that is grammatically anywhere near correct. Um, and I go, do I really like, okay, so then let me follow that. Let me follow that desire a little further. Then it becomes my voice of logic, my my um, uh, devil's advocate conversation. Mm -hmm. And I go, let me follow that a little further. If I had that, what would I do with that? What would be different? And then I recognize that not much would be different except circumstances. And then there's a whole other bunch of things to balance. Should I have that? So what does it matter if I have it or if I don't like what I just had that desire that was just a desire I had out of habit and momentum sometimes it's not sometimes it's like no I really would like to have that because it's an avenue of expression and and um, uh, uh, participation in my bubble of perception and my data of life that I would like to experience and so then it becomes a legitimate desire and then I mm -hmm. allow it to exist and then I don't give it much more thought because I usually I grow tired of the words associated with it and then I just let it go. <laughs> I don't write it down. I sometimes I hear you go, write that down, write that down, write that down. And then I go, no, nah, you don't have to write it down. If it comes up, it comes up. <laughs> but yeah, I, I can see for my for myself when that happens. Um that you know that it was actually a desire that was operating below the the what we're using mm -hmm. instead of the word level. I use I like the word threshold. Threshold be below the le threshold of of recognition because it was kind of always there, and I just assumed that it was my desire until I just until it came up again, and then I was like, "Do I really want that? Why would I really want that? What would what would change in my life? Sometimes I really want it just to experience it, but not it usually. It usually loses its power as soon as I put my attention on it. It just gets balanced, and the rest of it it doesn't. Sometimes it disappears. Sometimes it becomes part of a desire that I keep, but it loses that. that you know, it was it was definitely below the threshold of recognition, and I recognize it. Beautiful timing for me for this review. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that's actually the key. That's the reason I mentioned uh, the other is because I'm elucidating the difference between above and below the threshold of active recognition. Donna just helped elucidate that point that when we're doing our practice, especially when we start to get into hydrostasy and we're doing our practice almost the entire day to some extent, we start to become more aware of the desire, intention, and will triangle. When we're below the level of active recognition, we are not. And that's kind of the reason we can see that we're when it's not because that's the world. And then if we do our practice long enough, eventually we start to be able to see this desire, intention, and will. And the line that we trace it to will almost always be the nemesis and the destroyers. That will be there, especially if it's below the level of recognition. It's not an inspired, basically the desire and the intelligence points of the two different triangles are still very far apart if it's being influenced by the four destroyers and the nemesis. Does that make sense? One of the aspects of the social destroyer, at least in the United States, is capitalism. And that can begin to affect everything, infect everything, if the mind is below the level of recognition and they're not seeing it and they're not making these connections, which a lot of people wouldn't make these connections because it hasn't been organized into a nice, neat practice. But we're about to do that. So, or a nice delivery mechanism so that we can see, oh shit, like when I'm below this threshold, of active recognition, my desires are almost entirely being because we're below the, the threshold of active recognition and we don't live in a vacuum. We live in a world that's tugging and pulling and constantly trying to influence us. And that's feeding what we call the nemesis. And if we feed the nemesis, 
we are influenced by those four destroyers. And then before you know it, our desire is being socially influenced. It's a part of the habits that we've created already. It's because we're bored and now we need all of these different sources of entertainment or we're just chasing our biology, which is chasing our own tail. And it's strong, it's biology. It's gonna be a strong one, which is why the world plays on it so much. So if you notice that some of these destroyers start to work and cohabitate, they start to uh, work together. So the society destroyer will start to work with the biology destroyer. And now they've teamed up and they're even, oh, Neo, she's putting on her coat. You're literally going outside right now. She's not going fast enough. Not fast enough, apparently. I not fast enough. She's like, he's like, why do you have to put on all your fur? What's the problem? All right. So uh, I can see where this topic comes up as we're talking about the, the trick of emphasis for mm -hmm. all the reasons that I stated before. Yes. Because if if you're if you're maintaining emphasis on points that you've established in advance, then uh, it really quiets the mind to um, an, uh, another level of, uh, I know you hate that word, another threshold of quiet. Because <laughs> establishing presence quiets the mind to a certain degree. Um, but when you are using the points of attention chosen in advance, then that, you know, a desire, an intention and will triangle um, becomes more evident. So it's 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 quieter than if you just were relying on um, whatever in the moment. Here I am, you know, what's around me, my sight as my dominant, you know, and then trying to uh, establish presence is not an is not a is a degree of of quieted mind. But but using um, tricks of attention chosen in advance is another threshold of presence that you that allows you to maintain emphasis and it makes those other things cl clearer you know you can feel the pull from presence more acutely you don't fall so far from it because you've established those points in advance and i know you've told us that from the see this is why beginning steps are so valuable when you're seeing it after some years of practice through a different lens you can actually see um how how it works um it's really amazingly elegantly organized Ernest. it's just it's very impressive well thanks uh i think it will get more impressive as we go along though the more we get to hydrostasy the more you're uh especially ida because she used these words magic a long time ago and I think that the more that she gets to these aspects of hydrostasy, the more that magic is going to reveal itself. And then it's like, oh, that's where we were headed all along. And, that's and it's not and it's not brushes with magic. It's I am the magician. Exactly. Yeah. I am the magician and life is the magic. And I'm just uh, putting things where I want them to be. Yeah. 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 And there's still some words that I'm I'm uh, allowing to come to me to describe certain states of being. But we'll get there. So these these words uh, have a few already, and I can I can go over those in a sec. Okay, uh, let me write that down. States of being. Described so that I can remember to go back to that if we have time. Uh, and magical is an okay word, but typically magical magic is um, used as it's um a, it's like a trick. It's like um uh, illusion. It's like a miracle. Yeah, it's yeah, like it, it has occurred uh, spontaneously without any rhyme or reason. It's just the magic mm -hmm. of life. And it's it is a lot of rhyme and reason involved. So but that's OK. I, that's I think that word. we get stuck if we I understand the reasons for not choosing certain words because societally they have culturally they have a lot of um, it's it's usually viewed in a different way. But I think if we get stuck on that. um We'll never, we'll have to invent a whole new language in order to um, communicate. Hydrostasy, we've already started, because <laughs> that's not a real word. Yeah, just had to go and just make shit up because there wasn't anything uh, currently existing that fit the bill, so. So when you say there's nothing left for me to teach, it, it, maybe there is, maybe maybe that other language will, will come into play. 
Let me clarify that for a second. So sometimes when I say that there's nothing left for me to teach, there's just, I, I want there to, I want to acknowledge that the more we get into the unseen and the unknown, the less there are descriptions that can be shared and techniques that can be shared and you see what I mean? So I do. I understand. I know. I'm just teasing you because there's always something left to teach and maybe Maybe right. it's the language right. of what we're talking about. Sure. It's not, an, it's, an, yeah, you can't talk about what's not talk aboutable. <laughs> I get it. Yeah, a lot of it is, is experienced rather than words. And I think that some other practices and some other cultural type of things and the stuff that we see in social media sometimes, they are trying to verbalize what is unverbalizable and then we end up with 16 different types of intelligence we end up with all of these different things that people and uh, and it's just a it's great and i don't i have no problem with any of it it's all nice to scroll past really quickly um but i just don't see a lot of benefit in dividing the infinite into words that cross over don't really translate very well and I even do this as a part of, of the way that I share Qigong and the way that I choose to share Tai Chi. I will only talk about these energies and stuff only to a certain extent, just because we're dividing the infinite up. And now we have all of these different things that people feel unfamiliar with, and it starts to feel more esoteric than it needs to be, if that makes and sense. And then we're just, yeah, then we're just overwhelming our mind with words which mm -hmm. is what we're trying to avoid. I get it. I re I do. I'm yep. sorry. I didn't mean to take you off the, no, the good. emphasis topic, but it. Um, I was trying to tie it back to that, but um, you did. I get yeah. it. I get it. I get why this stuff comes up in these different, different topics. Yeah. Yeah. They're relatable because, and also because of where we're at as a group, it all relates even more. So maintaining Emphasis is what we'll talk about next, but so establishing presence and the trick of emphasis, I call it the trick because you have deliberately intended the points of attention in advance, and the more that you remember your deliberately intended points of attention in advance, the more that you're above the threshold of active recognition and everything starts to take care of itself. We become more aware of our desires in relation to the destroyers and the nemesis versus desires that are intelligent. So intelligent will be highly functional, won't waste a lot of energy. It will help everybody win, win, win. You know, it's good for the earth. It's good for the people directly involved and it's good for us. If it's got those three W's, then very likely it's a functional aspect of human cognition and will help lead to adaptability in the evolution of species change over time. That's kind it's of- also kind a, of... It's also a way to keep us checking ourselves. Well- you know, is, is it a win, win, win? Then why am I doing it? Exactly. Then it's a desire that's falling below the threshold of 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 active recognition. Likely created below the the threshold of active recognition because we were talking about kids, and what parents and society slowly does is it robs them of the freedom and the adaptability. They start out that way, but then before you know it, they're clinging and attaching to their objects of desire. And if you remove them, then they suffer. And that ultimately makes even the kids sometimes less adaptable. Now, I think they can get back there quicker because they're less removed from it. But the the older they get, the more that we're robbing them from. And remember, when I use the word freedom, I mean the freedom to have this toy or to not have this toy and still feel free. Kids, when they're young enough, they can turn anything into a freaking toy because their mind is still more free. So they can have the object. Or they could forget the object at home and just, you know, make it up in their mind with the rock. As kids get older and they're being pulled by the nemesis and the destroyers because parents aren't aware of the threshold of above and below active recognition, we're not teaching it to our kids because parents aren't doing it themselves because nobody's really talking about it. Before you know it, the mind that is below the level of recognition is teaching their kids how to exist below the, the threshold of active recognition, they're feeding the nemesis and almost all of their desires will be directly relatable to the four destroyers. You want a Ferrari? I bet you I could, I could find the causal link below the level, below the threshold of active recognition. 
that ties to the four destroyers, almost always. Yeah, but it, the, 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 there's no inherent evil in the in the Ferrari. But I have a perfect example. There was a, a, a triangular shaped uh, wooden apparatus in the middle of their living room yesterday. And the two-year-old, just under two-year-old, was climbing up one side of it. You know, it had vertical bars, uh, horizontal <laughs> bars. And she was climbing up one side of it and we were chatting and she you know wanted to go down the other side but didn't have the the agility to do that yet she hadn't discovered a way to do that yet and and that was what she was processing and she got her upper body a little too far over and started to topple and my nephew immediately jumped up and grabbed her like by the head and shoulders to keep her from from hitting the ground and she got scared you know, she started to cry, but then she realized I'm not, and he's very calm. So, uh, you know, he was checking to make sure he didn't twist her neck when he grabbed her or whatever, but he, he immediately got calm and she got calm because of it. And he's like, you're, you're okay. You know, I know that was scary. He, he legitimized her feeling. He let her have it. And then he said, and then she walked back over to it and he said, sure, get back on. And he wanted her to go do it again so that she didn't have a fear of it and didn't dismiss her toys. He didn't make a fuss over it because she was learning her body in space. And that's what you're supposed to do. And but but all of us, I realized, did not resist the urge to when, when she got to the top to show her how to do it. See, put, if you put your leg up first and then go over the top and you know what? She might come up. She's very um, uh, she has good agility for her age, it's beyond what I see most children that age able to do because she's willing to try different things to figure it out. And we should have all just shut up and let her figure it out and been available there to catch her in, so she didn't hurt herself. But she could have figured out a way to flip over that thing that was completely different than putting your leg around the side. And so after the third time, you could see she was trying to remember what she was told to do as opposed to figuring out herself. And I recognized immediately everything you just said, that that here we are trying to impose on her the right way to get over. There's lots of ways to get over the top of that. She just has to figure out her body in space. And as she grows, the weight of her head as opposed to the weight of the rest of her body is gonna change. So getting over that will change as well and let her figure it out. Yes, your job is to be there to make sure she doesn't hurt herself because she's a baby and you're the parent and that's what you do. Like I was thinking of animal kingdom stuff, you know, and maybe sometimes you fall on your head, um, you know, but, but yeah, I can see how we're all so ready to teach her what to do and how to do it and the right way to do it. And there is no right way to do it. There's just lots of ways to do it. And so let her figure it out. They're pretty good with that but i could see all of us as as the adults in the room wanting to um get in the way of that of that one one reason i would say that is because through their lens of perception the habitual organization of their lens of perception their minds are beginning to no excuse me the adults minds almost entirely wants to rely on knowledge and not intelligence because they're relying on knowledge and not intelligence. So and also checking the my behavior, it was fear. I want to make sure she doesn't get hurt. So I want to teach her the right way to do it so she doesn't get hurt. And that, you know, yeah. I mean, there are some things where there are absolutes. When you drive a car, you know, don't overturn the steering wheel so you can, but you know, there's ways that you figure that out by by doing it the wrong way. So get in a giant parking lot when you're teaching somebody to drive and let them feel the difference, but whatever. Uh, uh, I don't want to get too off topic, but yes, I could see exactly what you're talking about. The, how we get our lens gets clouded with other people's um, direction, influence, and we lose the freedom to discover our own way of, navigating mm -hmm. and then also the freedom to have or not have and still feel free because we've begun to uh below the at the threshold of active recognition is where all the clinging and attaching and the extreme sources of suffering will come from scorekeeping all, all of, of that. that yeah yeah and while we want to look at objects things and stuff and say that there's nothing inherently um I, we might use the words erroneously, but right or wrong. And I would agree that no object is necessarily right or wrong. 
a lot of what we create in the world today is coming from the place of the nemesis and the four destroyers. So when we say that it has no inherent, no, a lot of things do have a, at least a, an aspect of inherent dysfunctionality. They do because they were created from a mind that is below this threshold of act of recognition. The inspiration came from it because their desire, intention, and will triangle are not very clear in the common lens of perception. That's kind of a, a whole nother topic uh, that we don't have to get into. So when, and we, but we will later because it will definitely start to fit in more as we go and we get closer to these really interesting, I think, okay, all the topics are interesting, but they get really interesting as we get closer to hydrostasy and the three different aspects of hydrostasy. So ultimately, the Egong practice can be very beneficial because in the four directions, I'm telling you what to do. With vision, we want to use peripheral vision as often as we can remember. As you're going throughout your day, I prescribe that we pay attention to shapes, that we pay attention to reflections, that we pay attention to shadows, that we pay attention to light sources, where's the light coming from, et cetera. William, did you have a addition? No, I'm sorry. I'm having some challenge. I'm listening though, but I have oh, okay. some yeah, most of my apologies. No, you're good. Um, so other aspects of we were talking about the directions of attention, the introspective, the internal direction. In the very beginning of Egong, let's pay attention to our feet and our hands as often as we can remember throughout the day. Let's start with objects of power, things like rings, watches, rocks, stones. Now I do give a little bit of freedom in the object of power that you select, and I do make recommendations. But with the Egong practice, it's not in itself a recommendation. It's a, it's a prescription. Find you an object of power and take it with you throughout the day, no matter what you choose. You can tie a bow tie around your wrist. I don't care what it is. Can you pay attention to that as a reminder to be present and engage your prescribed, pre-intended points of emphasis that we call tricks of attention, right? So things uh, in terms of touch, the if we are just engaging the five senses, which only one of the five at any given time is one of the directions because the five senses is still just one direction, but I'll touch on all five clothes on our skin. We can always check into the moment and we can feel the fabric on our skin. It's there. You can always feel it. If you have an object of power, like a ring or a watch, again, that's tactile touch. I have been really enjoying essential oils for olfactory. Maybe you smell, uh, you smell better. Uh, your ability to smell is better and you can use other things. I really have to put essential oils like on my sleeve or on my collar so that I can smell them at all. I have sensitive skin, so I can't, I don't want to put it on my skin, but every now and then I'll put a, an essential oil or something, not perfume, none of that stuff. Cause that doesn't settle well with me uh, personally. Ida, I know you love perfume and that's all good, but it, no, I can't, I can't do it. My sinuses are like, mm -mm. so, uh, but a little essential oil is okay. And I can uh, engage my olfactory senses. That's all still the five senses, you know, the feet and, and hands, that's body awareness, breath. I prescribe what we can do with our breath in the beginning of the Egon training. And you can do other things. So you can add stuff to it, but that's not necessarily the Egon training. Uh, William is here. It's not Burger King. You can't have it your way and still be Egong practice. You can add to it and that's fine, but you still have to do the minimum that I recommend because they build on each other and it will help with the rest of the practice. Specifically like peripheral vision and your bubble of perception. When it comes to sound listening behind you helps to expand the bubble of perception. Also great for spatial awareness and safety. All that makes sense. And in terms of cognition, I give you what to do with the imagination. I tell you exactly what I want you to do in the Egong training with your imagination. You're not trying to maintain all four directions, but all four are accessible to you at any moment. And all four have predetermined points in advance. And that creates a toolbox for you to choose. And then before you know it, you have a very diverse toolbox in four different directions, eventually leading to maintaining at least one direction at all times. And when you can do that, 
we're getting into the hydrostasy training. In order to do that, there's probably a lot of counterbalance in warrior training. Does all that make sense? So, yeah, it does. When class is over, could I just spend five minutes with you talking about these two separate books and how they interrelate? Because yeah. I have a whole bunch of ideas coming in my head. Yeah. And yeah. I expect that there'll be more books and they'll all interrelate. The first two that I'm I'm creating, though, is the Egong, which is layer one. And there'll be four, at least four. I might have to split hydrostasy into three. So there might be one, two, three, four, five, six. So there might be six because I think the hydrostasy, maybe even warrior training will need two separate volumes. And they're short. They're simple. They're not not a lot of long drawn out explanations like you're used to from me. It's just very, this is a paragraph of what you should do. No, you can go do it or don't do it, but it's right there in front of you. So that may be helpful to some. Other people may want something that's a little bit more freestyle. And if it's freestyle, then you just use the bridge framework to create your own freestyle. I don't necessarily recommend that though. Not not if you're if if the mind is already monkey, I really recommend the egong practice because that will really help focus. And then maybe later you can start to add your own, you know, points of emphasis how you see fit. All that makes sense? So I that's pretty much all I have in terms of establishing points of emphasis specifically in advance. When we do that, they become what we call tricks of attention. If I say trick, I fundamentally mean that you have intended this point of attention in advance. It's If you're doing the Egong practice, it's going to be written down somewhere on your person. Whether I don't recommend it in your phone, but that can work because nowadays the phone is just, it's a huge distraction, but it could still work. I'm not, I'm not going to be that dogmatic with it, but I do recommend a note card or a piece of paper with your points of attention in your pocket so that you can recall it anytime you want. That will actually be one of the aspects of Egong. And it's not a recommendation. It's if you're doing Egong, you have something on you that has a few of your points of attention written down. You're either doing it or not doing it. So we have been very freestyle up to the Egong practice, and that's okay. Freestyle is good. Egong is good. And a person can kind of, which is best for them. For 99% of people that approach this practice, though, I really think they should start with Egong. Too much freestyle leads to coasting if you don't really know what you're doing, and coasting leads to not really doing the practice. Not doing the practice means it's not going to do anything, and um, not doing something leads to not having a result from it. <laughs> That's pretty much cause and effect don't exist because there's no cause to create the effect. However, and I'll kind of, this is a little bit of foreshadowing. So are there any questions about what I mean by emphasis in advance or creating and establishing points of emphasis, specifically tricks of attention? it is one of the most unique factors to this particular practice. And it's something that I can't really attest another teacher. You know, I don't, nobody really gave me this. I kind of had the realization and I've told you guys this story many times where I realized I wasn't doing anything. And if you're not doing anything, how can you expect anything to occur different if nothing in the dynamic has changed? So I realized- What is there to remember? Am I present? Oh, I forgot again. What am I? What? Are, so what is presence? And then you got to go over the whole, what am I doing? I'm not, it's an activity. And if exactly. you, what are you forgetting? Forgetting and remembering, what are you forgetting? You're forgetting your practice, your activity. Right. What activity have you chosen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the activity of being present. And the way that we are present is with established points of attention. And then, of course, next topic, we'll get into that uh, next week, but is that next week? Yeah, next week is maintaining emphasis, and that's where we introduce the rule of three, and we start to talk about the traps of attention. And then it really starts to get interesting. I think all that stuff is really wildly interesting. That's fun to talk about. Now, ultimately, we have some results 
from this practice. From the Egon practice, I have four simple results. Just keep it really simple, really basic. We don't you know, need to get into this myriad of things that I guarantee. I can't guarantee better health. You may have screwed up your health so much up to that point that you're still going to have some health issues. I don't know. Uh, it, you know, so I'm not prepared to make guarantees that I don't think are demonstrated so far or don't seem grounded in firm principle. Again, desire, intention, and will. My desire is not to make up a bunch of shit just for the sake of making up a bunch of shit. My desire is to organize a way to get to a certain aspect of this practice. And that's kind of what I'm going to foreshadow now. So one of the things that we talk about with this practice is what we call the lens of perception. The lens of perception is the totality of your entire life experience and the totality of your being and your essence and everything in the moment, actively happening right now. So anything past is stored in your memories. Any ideas that you have about the future is a machination of your imagination. That's all still always happening now. You're, you're imagining it now. You're recalling it and remembering it still now. The action point in the universe is always the present moment right now or a microsecond ago because of the way that the brain processes. But I'll even get into how to catch up to the present moment because there is something that arrives before recognition and that's attention itself. Attention itself arrives in the present moment presently. Any type of processing is always post. That could get a little, uh, I may need to describe that in more depth, but that's a little bit later. So ultimately, through this practice, we start to cleanse our lens of perception because we're above the threshold of active recognition we're aware of our thoughts, we're aware of our emotions, we're aware of our behaviors. Eventually, we could become more aware of our desires, our intentions, and what we're bringing into fruition with our power of will. All that makes sense? A, a clean lens of perception doesn't mean that they're better than somebody. or we're, It just means that they're, they're probably learning a lot of freedom and learning to uh, bring themselves in alignment to the present moment so that they can grow, they can adapt, they can learn. Ultimately, we do probably become better people, better in terms of more functional to the species, win, win, win. I really appreciate this review today, Ernest. For sure. Very, very beneficial. <laughs> yeah. And they'll continue because we have 20 topics and then uh, Tuesday's class has, is over after that. We can keep doing something on, on Tuesdays, but it, it won't be this. Uh, because there's just 20 topics and we're on topic six now. Yeah, we're on topic six. Next week will be topic seven. Now, here's something else. One of the ultimate aspects that happens with this practice is through something that we call deliberate modulation, sensing energy, and the act of alignment or adaptation. The more that we practice that, the more that we get used to altering, changing, not really manipulating, because that implies subject and object, but we're able to shift. You could say that you're shifting the focus of your aperture and how your lens of perception views the world. And you can learn to do that at will. Now, there are things that can change your lens of perception through activities, maybe a near-death experience. Maybe you are in a sporting event and you're reaching peak performance. All of that is a shift in your lens of perception. When you're in an extreme, you very likely are shifting and altering your lens of perception. But homeostasis, it wants to go back to its, its balance point, whatever that is. Uh, the... For most minds, it's a very habitual way of looking at the lens of perception. It's orientation. Uh, if we're looking at it as a lens that focuses and can do different things, that lens is habitual because the mind is below this threshold of active recognition. And so almost all of it is habit, conditioning, memory. That's where their aperture goes back to. So if you are in an extreme situation where your life is on the line, 
your lens of perception will go away from its habitual orientation. Does that make sense? Scientists, psychologists will start to call that state memory. What is state? That is our lens of perception is our state of being. Does that make sense? Any questions about what I'm talking about in terms of lens of perception in relation to your state of being, in terms of the way that you see and feel and experience your entire life? The moment itself is being focused through a lens called the human being in this example, and that is the lens of perception. The ultimate ability, I should say, the skill that we will accumulate towards the end of hydrostasy is the ability to alter and shift and change your lens of perception at will. Because of your desire, your intention, and your will are in alignment to intelligence, knowledge, and wisdom. When that circle completes, you can now change and alter in inconceivable ways. And I won't talk about all of the inconceivable ways because I don't know them all. <laughs> I mean, I, only, I, I, I know only a, a drop in the bucket, like one little drop in a bucket the size of the ocean. That's how much I have experienced in terms of shifting, altering, and changing the orientation at will. We start practicing that from the very beginning to a certain extent. We really start practicing that with deliberate modulation and sensing energy and the act of adaptation. The act of adaptation requires the four guarantees of this system of the egong system, especially, excuse me, the egong system, which is a relaxed mind, a peaceful, a peaceful, or a, a, excuse me, a peaceful mind, a calm attitude. Uh, what were the four? I have them on my note card. I just want to make sure I use the right words. A peaceful mind, a calm attitude, a balanced emotional state, mm -hmm. and an impeccable self-awareness. Mm -hmm. There we go. I got the four here because I do my Egon practice. So I'm practicing what I teach. I um, love it. There was a time I didn't understand at all what you were saying, but mm -hmm. uh, it is beautiful seeing things come into a rotation. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Very interesting. So the, the world has all kinds of ways of shifting and altering their lens of perception. Alcohol, that will shift the orientation of your lens of perception. Drugs, sexual experiences, near life death experiences, sports, you know, there's all kinds of things that can potentially shift and alter our lens of perception. But that is also using circumstances, conditions, and things like that to do it which at the end of the day isn't the end of the world. You know, I'm not saying that one should never, no, but balance is the principle between situations. I don't know what it's like to win the Super Bowl. That's a, that's a shift in the lens of perception that requires a Super Bowl and being a football player. So I'll, I, I very likely will never be able to shift my lens of perception to that particular orientation. It requires a lot. But there are all these shifts of the lens of perception that are actually far more infinite in nature that require no outside circumstances that we can- They're internal... infinite also because you're evolving. Your lens of perception is gonna- Change over time. Is going to change over time. Mm -hmm. And also world event, um, the present moment events are going to change over mm -hmm. time as the earth evolves and people move as, as I wanna say as time, moves forward but that's, that's erroneous okay. also <laughs> um okay. talking about it so you as your lens changes then the way that you interact with your um other tricks of attention and 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 what desires and um it, your desire intention and will will adapt and change along with it so Yes. as your lens mm -hmm. perception changes so it's it's always an evolving process it's never going you don't reach the end of it. Mm -mm. No. So. Yeah, there's there's no end in sight. So ultimately, though, I have created something that I call the abstract principles. 
In addition to the abstract principles, I will give examples of how I personally choose to shift and alter my lens of perception, therefore changing the way that I perceive my experience. That's a heavy ass sentence and paragraph. So let me know if that's not if that's not making any sense. I'll give you a quick example. Oftentimes, we want to look at time in a linear fashion, right? We want to look at the past as something that happened before, the present is something that is happening now, and the future is something that will happen. That's the common way of looking at time. When you there is a way to shift your lens of perception to view all three at the same time. How can you do that? Because there's no such thing. And the reason that you can do that is because you can hold the feeling of a memory in the present moment and a type of future image or a type of feeling of how you, you know, can imagine feeling in the future. You can, you can contain all three of those at the same time. And it is experiential. And that's why I don't teach that. I will explain it to you what I'm doing with my lens of perception, but I'm, I, I don't, I'm not going to teach that. That's getting that's getting a little weird. <laughs> that's, to me, that feels a little bit mystical in a sense. I don't think it's weird because I think that as we evolve in this practice, as we even grow older in time and have more experience, you can look back at a a an event of the past. It's the only way I can describe it as a childhood. You have a childhood memory or a teenage memory or a high school memory, and through the lens of perception you have now, you realize that I assigned meaning to things that didn't really exist. I assigned meaning to my body perception or the way someone spoke to me or the way that I decided the world viewed me. And, and as an, at, at this, through the lens of perception at this time, I, I recognize that those were all just machinations of my mind. They weren't necessarily accurate to the truth because what is the truth like when i speak to 15 different people they might have a different perception of that experience so what was the experience actually it was the totality of my understanding and the effects of uh, a mind falling below the geez, i keep forgetting the word you want to use threshold. Um, the threshold of of recognition and now i can see it through it through a different lens, just like I was watching my nephew and, and niece operate with their child and view things in a way that I I might have viewed it differently had it, hadn't I been this age at this moment with this practice, with this lens of perception. So um, it, makes, it makes perfect sense that you can manipulate it because if, if what I did when I was 16 was th that, I, uh, it was really through that lens of perception and I can see it now through a different lens of perception, then I can s change my lens of perception and see it a multitude of different ways if I choose, because I, I practice th those deliberate modulation and sensing energy and all of those things. There would be a million different ways I could look at that. And I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> there's not only one way to look at something. So it, yeah. it really makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what you're saying it's a, it doesn't seem mystical or magical it's just um sometimes it's just folly it's it's like i can exercise changing my lens of perception because it it's because it can because <laughs> and because it's what i desire and so i'm going to place my intention intention and attention on that and that's it yes. and it's amazing what becomes available through that all kinds of things become available, things that I may choose, that, that may be um, ways I want to move forward in the world, um, ideas about elegant solutions to problems, creative endeavors I want to maintain, or just for fun. You know, it doesn't have to be anything. And ultimately, the ability to shift your lens of perception at will, to collaborate with the lens of perception and experience in the way that I'm talking about it will make a person supremely adaptable, like infinitely adaptable. So uh, the example that I was giving is, so when I'm 
I'm walking in Chicago, and you have to keep in mind, I'm in the, a, a hydrostasy description, so there's far less words. I'm only using words to describe it to you now, but I don't require words to, to shift the lens of perception and to feel it. So walking through a big city, I can hold in context all the big cities that have ever existed, right? There's so many cities that we're walking on right now because they no longer exist. They have through time crumbled away and dirt has risen and they're now underground. That is the context of the past. And I'm walking through the third largest city. That's the context of the, of the present. And eventually this will all be gone. Every single thing that we're doing right now, everything that we're talking about, everything that we're interacting with will cease to exist. Whether it's when our star, star goes supernova or before. Eventually, absolutely every single thing that we talk about, create all of it outside of the vibration that we're sending into the ether. That may last a little bit longer than our things and our stuff, but there will be no internet. All of our books will burn when, when the sun goes supernova. It will all evaporate into its molecular basic and it will cease to exist. And that's not, that's not a negative thing, but I'm holding all three perspectives in the moment, feeling wise, it's a feeling. I'm not talking to myself because I'm deep in the hydrostasy practice and I shift my lens of perception to what I call the timeless nature of infinity. You And one of the ways to set up the timeless nature of infinity is to pay attention to the infinite detail of the present moment without words, without talking about it. That's why this is a hydrostasy practice because it does not require words. And that's assuming that we have created space in the mind in the first place. Now, there are steps to hydrostasy in the Egong practice. Establish your four directions, all four. Now, I'm not talking about one point of attention. I am telling you to engage and maintain four different points of attention simultaneously. That's embodying the rule of three. And that may sound heavy. I get it. There's a lot of room in this practice. I'm, I'm, we're setting the bar on the infinite scale here, and I just can't help it. It is what it is. So eventually, when we start to get into hydrostasy, we are maintaining four directions of attention within the four modes. We always have four directions of attention when we're sitting, standing, walking, or laying down and transitioning between them. That's a whole lot of above the threshold of active recognition. And what happens? Thought doesn't stand a freaking chance. We create authentic, real, tangible gaps in the overall amount of thought. And that can be felt. That creates a feeling in your head and in your brain that you can start to pay attention to, and that will grow. When that starts to grow, you are, you are doing the hydrostasy training. You're paying attention to that space in your mind, and that gives you the opportunity to use emotional memory, to choose how you want to feel. And again, we're not talking about it necessarily. We're not thinking about anything. We're able to shift our lens of perception to 1970s Brown or what it was like to hit the door at summer vacation. We're also able to take the scope of our bubble of perception and process that into memory. I call that imprinting the present moment, and I also call it sensing energy, sensing the world around us without words, without, you know, trying to control and manipulate and label. And because I'm assuming that we're past that in this in this portion of the practice, right? That also leads to techniques that I'll offer for adaptability and behavioral change, because we may start to realize that a lot of our behaviors are not in alignment to desire and intelligence. It's desire that's being influenced by the four destroyers. Why do you want that new job? Why do you want to impress that woman? Why do you want to go jump out of a plane? Why do you want a $450,000 car when people just down the street are starving? I can, I can direct all of that to the nemesis and the four destroyers. That doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means that you have been influenced by forces that you're unaware of. And that's okay. No, that's not the end of the world. It's happened to me. It's happening to you. It's happening to everybody. Just like I'm creating new habits, but because of my cognitive attention training, I'm aware of them right away. And if they start to get out of balance, which inevitably they will, I'm able to go back to my practice, redirect and maintain emphasis. This is all in the practice. And then eventually, 
because our mind is clear. We're able to choose how we want to feel. We are able to later shift the lens of perception in the way that we perceive our present moment entirely. Almost like you just took three or four hits of acid, but not the same, because that shifts, shifts your lens of perception in a very particular way. You will learn to shift your lens of perception in a very particular way, such as, but not limited to, and maybe not even, the timeless nature of infinity. And that's one that I prefer. I fucking love the timeless nature of infinity. It feels so good and expansive, but it's not, you know, it's not like, um, it is emotional because my, my lens of perception is responding to the shift, but it's not coming from the mind that's below active, excuse me, below the threshold of active recognition. It's not coming from habit, the four destroyers and the nemesis, or even the fifth destroyer. Altering and shifting our lens of perception can lead to supreme adaptability. Before you go into that boardroom, shift your lens of perception into the karma yogi to where you're doing this because you can, because you have a little time in your day to build a company. We're not going to let the heavy expectations because we're also assuming that we have started dreamwalking. Dreamwalking is a phrase that I use when the burdens of your everyday life experience cease to exist because we're creating those burdens. We emphasize those burdens. Those burdens get bigger and they get heavier. I can assure you that death as your advisor will look at those burdens and say, fuck off. That shit's not important. You're overemphasizing things that eventually will completely cease to exist. And if you're not getting immediate benefit from it, satisfaction from it, very likely it's leading and being a derivative directly from the four destroyers, which is because we're below the threshold of active recognition and therefore feeding the nemesis. And I do imagine a world that is no longer as dysfunctional as ours is, and their desires are fundamentally tied to intelligence. Imagine what we would create as a species if all of our desire was fundamentally tied to intelligence. Why do we need so many cars? Because we have spread ourselves out. Why have we spread ourselves out? Because every human being thinks they need 2,000 square feet plus a yard. Why do we think that? Me, I. Ultimately, every single aspect of that leads to a form of self-reflection, self-identification, and self-attachment. Thinking about yourself all the time leads to all of that. Because if that wasn't there, our desire would be in alignment to our intelligence and we would realize we have more than enough room for everybody. We have more than enough food for everybody. We have more than enough resources. Everybody can live at least somewhat luxurious. We can find a happy medium to where everything is clean and nice. We could do that as a species. We could totally do that. But we don't because our desire and our intelligence are freaking miles and miles apart. And that's because of the mind that is operating below the threshold of active recognition. That's the one source. I love you brought that up. I used to get so mad at you when you said that, but I really yeah. understand it now. Oh, you, you got mad at what? Uh, when you'd say that, like, oh, you don't need a big hell, you don't need this and that. I, I wouldn't understand it, but I, I really understand exactly uh, the meaning of what you're saying. And that, uh, that's just a, a beautiful place for me to be right now. It's very, very freeing. It also traces the reasons why it doesn't declare war on them. Um, it, you know, um, there, there is a way. At the, and it also brings light to the fact that the only thing that I can control in that scenario is me and my mind and um, where I'm placing it, and that I don't have to declare war on my, or, or even label it as success or failure. It's just noticing the direction of my mind and, and, and accessing something that is a better balance than before I decided to notice it. That's it. And then all the virtues that that Ernest is explaining um, 
and and more because my lens of perception is different than Ernest's lens of perception. So what comes to focus for me um, may be different and the way that I get there may be different. And some of them may be very similar. And that's where, where you start noticing the essence of things and the nature of things because, and the principles behind things because they are consistent among uh, they apply in, in this circumstance and that circumstance and this circumstance. And ah, this is more like a universal principle than it is just a, a belief system or perception of mine based on where I am at any moment. And that's a, you're participating in the evolution of mankind when you're doing that for yourself. But the only thing that you can change is how and when and, and to what extent you do it for yourself. Yes, I would say, though, so ultimately, we won't other, and that's focusing on what other people are doing, because the lens of perception isn't focusing on self, if that's required, you have to have the lens of perception on yourself in order to other. So if you're othering, and everything is about it, no, no, you're actually still focused on you. It's all about you, everything will trace back to you. But there is a an aspect of the human experience that you have, you can't con- completely deny like you can change your lens of perception Mm -hmm. in all the ways that you just described and you can participate in um doing that at will but if you don't have any awareness of your feet on the ground or your hands then 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 what do you then you might as well just take acid (laughs) because that that's not Right. That's not controlled and active and and unique to your experience. So there is some aspect of self. Um, uh, there is some aspect is. of the human experience. Oh, of course. But the difference is experience of it. Right. But the difference is that the lens of our perception isn't. Oh, I don't know where my camera keeps going when I do that. The lens of perception isn't focused on the self. The self always exists. Right. And that's fine. That is our lens of perception is, is the self. It's our imbalance. Yes. Yeah. But but the lens of perception isn't shining its focused lens on that construct of self, which is why I call it self-reflection, because it's the lens of perception reflecting on its own lens of perception, which creates all of the attachment, the clinging and the identifying and then ultimately the othering. Now, what I would say, though, the reflection is a really good that is for really- the reflection. Exactly. The reflection of self. That's all we're ever doing is we're projecting this reflection of what we think about ourselves, how we think we are, what we view ourselves as. And there's nothing inherently wrong with those views necessarily, but the more that we entertain them, especially below this threshold of active recognition, the more that we are going to attach and cling and ultimately suffer because we're less adaptable with it all. And then before you know it, I'm just not good at math. Well, why? Oh, you know, it's just not in me, just not good at it. Now, I do agree that some people with their lens of perception, they can arrive at certain things a little bit easier. You know, they've never had resistance in that area. So, Matt, but that doesn't mean a person can't do it. That's just a story we tell ourselves because unless your brain is physically incapable, and then that's a physical uh, thing that we would need to adapt to. And and nine times out of 10, though, that's not the case. I would- I'm shy. I'm yeah. I'll chew it. Whatever those That's labels an, are, those are yeah. reflections on those self. Reflections. Yes. An attachment to a reflection if we say I am this or I am that. And again, we're all in different, you know, uh phases or it's a degree of evolution of change over time so i'm not judging the person that's in the Ferrari. I'm not judging the person that wants to identify to different aspects of themselves. But I do see where it all comes from, and there's no need for me to even mention that because unless a person's practicing hydrostasy or, you know, is doing something to this extent, it's a completely moot point. I might as well be talking to myself. And then the desire to tell somebody about themselves, where is that coming from? That would very likely just be coming from below the threshold of active recognition and attachment to self leading to uh, a judgment of other. Now, what I would say, though, that is when we're in this hydrostatic state, meaning that we are shifting and determining and collaborating with our lens of perception. The mind is clear. We are determining how we want to feel. We're processing new 
emotional memory into our our data bank or you know our stored memory and we're adaptable we're using things to adapt to the habits that we've created already the world around us and that's leading to a lot of change over time we do affect the fifth destroyer and so in a way we are always when we're doing this practice helping the overall shift of change in the human species to what extent that really depends on you and how much you're committed to your practice and committed to determining and shifting your own lens of perception at will. That's the ultimate thing that this practice can do. Ultimate. The, the number one thing that we can learn to do with this practice is determine and shift our lens of perception. And that's even a little bit different than emotional memory and processing. Shifting your lens of perception may have nothing to do with emotional memory or what you're, what you were sensing from the present moment it may have nothing to do with either of those and you can shift your lens of perception in ways that are inconceivable potentially to other people or even inconceivable to yourself to a certain extent i started with the timeless nature of infinity because i do feel confident in describing that feeling to a certain extent some people will be like i don't know what the hell you're talking about i have a feeling this group can at least come to some uh okay that kind of makes sense in my knowledge bank ernest is sharing his experience my info and my experience i get it to a certain extent you know but we also i've always talked about this but we can help create the conditions for others around us that's our bubble of perception our bubble of perception can help create the conditions for what we're doing in the minds and the energy of other people, even without them knowing it. So we can have an influence on other people. But when we talk about desire, intention, and will, that is a completely different dynamic when it comes to other people, because everybody has free vote or <laughs> everybody has the opportunity for free volition, free will. Uh, it, the opportunity is there. If you're below the threshold of active recognition, that opportunity is being wasted. Because if we're below the threshold, we are operating almost entirely on condition and memory habit. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so as I go about my day today, when I get to the clinic, when I get into different situations, I will shift my lens of perception at will. And my feeling changes almost instantaneously. My emotional output changes almost instantaneously. It's not deliberate modulation necessarily. It's different. It's a little bit different than what I mean by emotional memory. And it's a little bit different than processing because I'm not processing a new thing necessarily. I have completely shifted the lens of perception. So everything going in and everything going out is fundamentally altered. And I will come up with a word for this. I haven't quite arrived at it yet. And one of the ways that we get to what I'm talking about, and there's no there because it's not a final destination. You're either doing your practice still or you're not. If you're not doing your practice, you, you cannot do what I'm talking about because the mind is below the threshold of active recognition. This is impossible when you are in habit and the momentum of habit, clinging and attaching and focusing on yourself and othering. How many of your thoughts, goals, things that you want to do involve yourself, other people, things and stuff? You, you can answer that yourself, but your desires, how many of your desires involve external money, adoration, promotion, health, safety, those are not bad things. But how many of your goals involve them? And how many of your goals involve the infinite? And I talk about that when I talk about abstract principles. So it sounds like you're saying that um, the practice is the practice, and that is a consistent a uh, metronome that exists um, as, as a foundation. Yes. And mm -hmm. when you're in hydrostasy and you're able to change the level of your, uh, you're able to change your lens of perception at will, mm -hmm. yes. you're just mm -hmm. shifting the balance in the points of attention from which ones 
have more foreground or background or um, how and where they populate in your bubble of perception with that foundational practice existing consistently. You're just shifting the points of attention um, um, in different ways. But it's all through the same lens of perception. You're just, it's like when you are taking a photograph you see a scene and you want to take a photograph of it, but you can change the aperture, you can change the zoom, you can change the, and you're still keeping this photograph with the balance of the components because you love the balance of color and scale and all of those things, or perhaps you want to change the balance, the scale of it or the, um, the color of it or the panorama of it. You know, you can manipulate all of those things but still maintain the same points of attention just in different ways. Does that describe it, changing it, your lens of it, perception? It describes more so a way to learn how to do it. And at a certain point, yes, it will involve your points of attention. But remember that eventually I offer four new directions of attention to eight directions of attention. The directions themselves don't necessarily determine the shift of perception. The shift of perception can be determined simply because of will, intention, and desire. So in the beginning, there can be all kinds of points of attention that can shift and alter your lens. And that's what we've been doing up, up you know, to a certain point in the practice. But eventually, you can actually learn to shift your lens of perception with the same points of attention that you were using before. I could go to very basic points of attention that I've done from day one, and that just gets me above the threshold of active recognition. As long as I'm above this threshold of active, my mind is active, I am present, I am here, I am aware of here, I'm aware of present, as long as that's there, however you do it you can alter and shift your lens of perception at will. Yes. Uh, but to set that up, one of the ways that we can set that up and start doing that is with specific determinable points of attention, such as peripheral vision, the bubble of perception, listening behind you. That creates a type of proprioception, sensory perception, where you're aware of your body and space and time that shifts and alters your lens of perception because of the points of attention that you're doing. Eventually, as long as you're above, that's eventually the only requirement is being above the threshold of active recognition, conscious awareness, awareness of awareness. And that's why I say that one of the four corners or the four results of uh, the Yigong is impeccable self-awareness. You're aware of your lens of perception. You're aware of your thoughts. You're aware of your emotions. You're aware of your behaviors. You're aware of your desires. You're aware of your intentions without judgment, without trying to control. You are highly privy to all of these things because of the momentum of your practice. That's why it requires momentum. And then that is what I call a clear lens of perception. But eventually, you will be able to shift your lens of perception at will. And that is also the point where it becomes wildly difficult to describe or help another person get there. Uh, because it's also not necessary. Once a person's lens of perception is clear, they're maintaining active recognition, they'll be able to shift their lens of perception how they see fit. Some examples of shifting your lens of perception, how you see fit, could be people when they're doing certain styles, animal styles of Kung Fu. They shift their lens of perception to the point where they are literally embodying that animal. That's a similar thing, but not quite the same thing that I'm talking about because there's some other things involved. But that is a, a way to look at it. You know, you're able to create a shift in the lens of perception without the traumatic event, without the near death experience, without the romantic encounter, that spark of newness. You're actually able to create certain things that will go beyond the definition of your current contextual language construct. Meaning you ain't got words to describe it, so don't even try. Thank you for that reminder. <laughs> no mm -hmm. words necessary. 
Right. And that's why I have a determinable ending to the bridge and an end to Igong, because I'm not going to get into uh, that. That starts to get a little bit into an area that I don't feel comfortable in. I feel like the desire for that is unnecessary. I don't need to do that. There's no reason to. So when I talk about the 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 it's a shift of perception because it's unique to you alone so what's the right. point of describing it other than self-indulgence um unless it's art unless it's i want to paint this and then well, of fine. course yeah. every person will look at that painting and see something different but you know perhaps there'll be an essence of something that that resonates um, yeah. from the place yeah. that you created it and this term will come up more and more abstract qualities qualities that are just uh, it's, it's really tricky to talk about you know you're either so i would say that they are unique they can be somewhat common as well it can other people can arrive at something similar but it is still fundamentally unique so there's really no point in talking about it now when people in my experience when i see people trying to divide up the infinite it's because they're also hoping to separate you from your money Often, that may not always be the case, but a lot of times when people are trying to offer these esoteric trainings, it's because they do want to manipulate you. They want you to be their student. They want you to pay their monthly fee. They want you to give them the recognition, the adoration. Then before you know it, we're putting their picture up on the wall with candles and we're meditating to them. And uh, that's that's good for whoever wants to do that. But I can see the violation of so many principles with that, which is one of the reasons eventually ecrolic.com is going away because I'm learning. I don't want it to be about me. If if it's going to be about anything, it's about the practice. It's about the egong practice. It's about the bridge system. It's not about earnest. That's a construct of self that can be a great example. You know, I don't mind sharing. I can teach all that's good, but about it's about the lens of perception. That's what this whole practice is about. Your lens of perception. Yes, William, did you have a- Hey, yeah, yes. yeah. Good morning again, everybody. And I've been listening as I'm, uh, and, and it's just the, the whole, we're looking, I've, I've, we looked at lens of perception from two different ways or maybe multiple ways, that, but I'm aware of two different ones. The last time I was just thinking of, we were talking about Originally, the lens of perception in you know the uh, your biologic uh, perception, your social economic, you know the variety of things we listed out that all have an impact on the lens of perception. But it's like then through the practice, you evolve to the place that you've cleansed that lens, and now you have this ability to uh, change the lens of perception. What I'm saying is, this, is it sounds like there's more than one way to talk about the lens of perception. You can talk about it from a grand, a bigger perspective of the, like kind of the all the other things that affect it and then the ability uh, that you develop to actually, um, and that's we, to alter or to direct the lens of the perception and your lens of, of perception uh, at will. Is that, you understand what I'm saying? It's kind of like, yep. I'm seeing it, like two different components from a, when you're beyond, when you're not within that, that, um, that field of recognition, you, when you're, be, when you're below it, then you're mainly affected by the, the lens of perception from all those previous things we listed. And then once you get beyond that, you kind of now have the ability to, after cleansing, now direct it and create with deliberate attention, a, a change in that lens of perception uh, freely or at will. Is that is that is, is that, that is it yep and, and 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 one of the powerful things about that is is that there are times uh when i have glimpsed that where i'm i made a deliberate um like i realized that um there's some things that i may convey with words but i wanted to convey a feeling without words to someone in a, or in an experience i wanted to create a feeling and and so I realized that what I need to do is not if I, if, if, I, if I do it without words, then I need to change the the perception and the inner feeling that I'm experiencing. So that is what emanates outward from 
from myself that then whoever is in my company will it potentially, hopefully, experience that as well. If that's my intent to share with them a feeling, but it's a feeling that kept is coming from me shifting my lens uh, and being very, very deliberate about how I hold my focus. Yes, and, and just 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 some things that have come to mind while I'm listening to to uh, to everyone. That's on point. I would say though that even as you're able to determine your points of attention, the other aspects are still an influence to a certain extent, right? So it's still going to be an influence. It's just not going to influence your desire, intention, and will. So you may still be hungry, no matter where you shift your lens of perception. I can I can shift my lens of perception to the timeless nature of infinity while my tummy's still growling, but because I'm not below the threshold of active recognition. I'm able to be okay with that. I'm able to be okay with the hunger because in the in the grand scheme, I know that I'm going to eat again. It's not, I'm not, I'm not my dog down here where if we're 15 minutes late, he literally thinks he's never going to eat again. And I'm assuming that's why he cries and whines the way he does. But yeah, so the lens of perception will still always include all of those factors. Uh, the body, the mind, our our past, our future, you know, our future imagination, all of that, hopes, dreams, aspirations. But as the lens of perception clears, our desire is more in line with intelligence, our two different stars that I have described starting right. to come together. Yeah. And now we are no longer specifically when we really start to practice the behavioral aspect, the behavioral change, because we're able to shift our lens of perception. That's how the behavioral change happens is by shifting your lens of perception rather than trying to force and, and try to control and, you know, do diets that you don't really want to do and exercise that doesn't feel good and you don't know why you're doing it. And so you end up quitting on January 14th when you started on January 1st, that type of stuff. And so all of those things will still be there but you are no longer being as influenced or even controlled by the, the five destroyers because you're not feeding the nemesis. So you may even be aware of some of your actions and some of your behaviors that have residual effect from the destroyers. That's what cognitive and behavioral attention training is all about. But the way you described it is spot on. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that also that's what I was left off with the last class is that a word you brought back in intelligence. Because it's, I think that that think that is why, and I, kind of like you're saying about all the other things, you know, people who it's not about that there's wrong anything wrong with a, a Ferrari or a, right. a desire inherently for a, a, a certain size home or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's when you look at where desire and um, will and intelligence how they intersect mm -hmm. when you make a decision about. Uh, and I just had the same conversation with my son, who his overhead is exceeding where he's at. And, and trying to get him to understand that, you know, his lens of per se, he, 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 he doesn't want to be in certain communities and it makes sense that he doesn't want to deal with certain things. But at the same time, there's a, another ad attitude he has about how he perceives himself or, and various things like that, that are in play in that. Um, but, but then what happens is that's where the intelligence is like, okay, so even if you have those feelings, if it's putting you in a position that is unhealthy for the overall lifestyle, then we see that your desire and will are not in balance. And it's like, that's where you see that. And that's what I was saying in the last uh, session is I can see how you can have these desire and will, and you can know better, but not necessarily do better because the uh, lens of perception is off so that you can't really even be influenced by your own intelligence the way you'd like to be. Bingo. Yeah, that's all spot on. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. And so, uh, Shana, I can hear an echo. But that's that's ultimately the the real. I wouldn't. I don't know if it's a goal because it just it happens with the practice. But being able to shift and alter your lens of perception at will above the threshold of active recognition to also help align your desires to fundamental intelligence. And one way that we can see fundamental intelligence is also by looking at the rest of the, the world, the rest of the universe, how things move. Uh, we could call that the Tao, the way the universe moves. I guess, if you want to use that word, doesn't matter. <laughs>
but yeah, any questions, comments, or concerns? I think that is definitely um, concise. Now, Egong, as I'm going to be sharing it, are specific points of attention. It is telling you or telling a person what to do with their attention, how to do it with their attention to help them progress through these four layers. They can add to it. That's fine. If you want to add the sound of trickling water because you just love it, you know, the sound of rain on a tent because you just love it, that's fine. That's not necessarily included in the Egong training, but to do the Egong training, you must do those points of attention that I recommend. Otherwise, it's it's not. And that's okay. It doesn't have to be. But I am very confident that a person, if they do the Egong training long enough, faithfully enough, with enough continuity and consistency, they will get to the place where they can alter and shift their lens of perception at will in alignment to intelligence, not in alignment to petty self-indulgence and, and these desires of things that will not matter when our sun goes supernova. But being able to shift your lens of perception at will can help lend to the evolution of consciousness, which could be something that is a contribution well beyond when our sun goes supernova. And that's what I mean eventually when I get into the abstract principles one abstract principle is to maintain and emphasize a desire that lives in the realm of the abstract, that is a part of the infinite fabric of the cosmos and intelligence. One of those could be the type of freedom I'm talking about, the freedom to have or not have and still feel free. That feeling could be the beginning of you setting up your abstract principles. I have a phrase that I call, I was calling ignition, but I do prefer Donna's luminosity. It, the, the luminous fibers of our being illuminates the fibers of the outside world. And you can see and feel the aliveness in everything. One of the abstract principles of hydrostasy is to find that and stay there. Do everything in your life, every activity, Everything that you're doing from the time that you wake up to the time that you go to bed in that luminosity, if you can do that, it will automatically be intelligent because you're, you're above the active le level of recognition because you're experiencing it and maintaining it. And it's all because of your practice, because you have your eight directions of attention active. And yes, I do get into eight directions. We started with four. That's how we set up our hydrostasy. Eventually, we can maintain eight directions of attention. The other four directions are all feeling. So, yeah. Wow. Thorough review today. Very uh, empowering. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so if we look ahead, our next topic is topic number seven, and that is learning. Oh, I did my camera again. I don't know. It's like when I pull my wire. Uh, so topic number eight or seven is maintaining emphasis. Maintaining emphasis is also one of the most common errors because people don't do the rule of three. And they're not redirecting their mind back to their practice. If you do not redirect, which I call the Tai Chi mind, because that's kind of where I developed it. I kind of developed it under the idea that I'm not trying to use force. I'm not going to be passive and just let these silly thoughts occur. I'm going to redirect. Redirect what? Back to the practice, back to the moment, back to my points of attention. That's the practice. If you don't do that, you will never be able to maintain points of attention. You will never be able to maintain a mind that is above the threshold of active recognition. The reason we call counterbalance counterbalance is because the mind is bouncing back and forth. Below and above, below and above, below and above. Counterbalance is mostly below with a, a little bit of above. Warrior training is mostly above with a little bit of below. Hydrostasy, you are maintaining a point of attention all throughout the day from the time that you wake up, from the time that you go to bed. No matter what direction that is, you do maintain at least one at all times. And I think Donna and others, Shana, William, we're all starting to prove uh, this group, Karen, Michael, we can prove that it is possible 
to maintain deliberate intention and attention throughout the day from the time that we wake up, from the time that we go to bed, whether it's introspective, whether it's the breath, whether it's regular sensory attention, whether it's proprioception, which is kind of the in-between, or whether, which one did I forget? Uh, uh, different forms of cognition, such as imagination, logic, reason, deduction, humor, music. These are what I also call, um, uh, what's the official phrase that I use? They're the, uh, the results of the evolution of consciousness, the virtues of the human's evolved mind up to this point, the ability to find something beautiful. Finding something beautiful is an aspect of your cognition that does not necessarily require words. And I get it. The moment we find something beautiful, we automatically know. The moment you think about beautiful, you, th you create ugly. But, the, but to appreciate and find something beautiful doesn't automatically create ugliness. Uh, Lao Tzu, all due respect, we just didn't talk about the role that thought plays in the Tao Te Ching enough. And that's the common theme is people don't talk about the thought that role, the, the role that thought plays enough. And I love that you forgot that cognition was the one that you needed to think about to remember. It just to me is a that's reflection right. of your practice and where you and and the and the threshold of balance occurring, that it it's not an overwhelming amount of thought for you because cognition is the one that you forgot. Um, the um, the other thing I wanted to say was, you know, as we talk about this stuff, forgetting, remembering, you know, at, at what have what we're doing at each um, di different as we move through these topics, is that there's a um, a fluidity that occurs. It's like sanding off the rough edges, remembering and forget. In the beginning of the practice, it's real clunky because we have a lot more momentum in um, things that below that fall below the threshold of recognition. But as we start to meet that threshold and 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 come um, ab above that threshold, the practice and the way that we move through these topics as you discuss them, I was thinking about the term luminosity and ignition and and there's a more fluidity. And um, occurring in our practice, there's more fluidity in our experience. It's more malleable. It it it's less bumpy. It's smoother. Um, so I don't know what term to come up with, but that luminosity when it occurs is 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 because there's that malleable um, fluidity that makes it almost imperceptible. It's like a it like it's like something changing form from solid to liquid um and then even to a gaseous you know what i mean the different the, the concentration and the bumpiness and the and the hard edges become less and less mm -hmm. and so you know i've kind of been working with the idea of different words to describe the phases of training so one of them was sage Sages training. The sage is a person who has relaxed their mind. They can create gaps in the overall amount of thought, and then they're the wise sage. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about some of these words because the way that they're used in the world, it can get a bit weird. But I do have the sage and then the warrior sage. Uh, that's similar to the, the sage, but they have taken it up a notch. They want to go even further with what they're doing to the point that they can alter their lens of perception. A person can stop with the sage and they're going to contribute to the world in a, in a much better way, in a much more productive way. So a person can stop at any point of the training and I still think benefit. So I don't want to think, want people to think that this is a trap, that they have to go all the way to the hydrostasy stage. If you don't, you, know, you don't have to do anything. I think once the sage's training is complete, then you have started to relax your mind. You're, you have cognitive attention, awareness. You have behavioral, emotional, sensory attention. So you're you're doing all right. You know, go do your thing. The warrior sage is one who is preparing to set up what I call the seer. The seer is when the lens of perception is more clear. We start to see and perceive the world differently. Now, what I want to call the rest is getting a little bit dicey. I don't really have a good word for a person who can alter their lens of perception. Um, 
Yeah, I don't. I think there's. I think you pointed out. You alluded to something. You touched upon something that's really important. Because when I changed my labeling myself during the beginning, as I moved through this practice with this group, um, that was very helpful to me. Was that when I remember, I I am moving with the direction that you're speaking about now. I'm pointed toward the warrior sage. I'm pointed toward, um, I, I am moving with flow, just where I'm, where I'm able to at this moment of time and at, at the totality of my experience at this moment. But that still contributes to the whole collective. So I can see what you're saying that you can stop at any given point and you, if you're practicing something, you are still in a process of moving toward the evolution of consciousness. And that adds value to the collective because we're all the collective. <laughs> we are all it. So um, any, any, um, any sanding of the bumps <laughs> is, is a valuable one. And you can decide to stay at any at any at any um threshold of practice any degree of practice because you have freedom of choice and if that functions for you and that's desirable for you and i i, I just think that if you are actively practicing it kind of lends itself to move towards the next thing but it doesn't have to be a measurement of success because each time you turn towards remembering you're in the flow and it's it's a contribution to yourself and to the whole because it can't be one without the other. Right. That makes sense. It allowed me just to have that thought allowed me to drop the evaluation and have less reflection on self and more um, emphasis on the doing of the practice instead of the how am I doing in the practice. Sorry, I just had some notes come up here. Let's uh, switch. That makes any sense? It made sense to me. Uh, uh, it makes less sense to me when I hear my own words, but um, it's the best I can do. Mm -hmm. And the titles, you know, they're not levels of attainment. That's really weird. Uh, I wouldn't look at it like that at all. But I do use the titles as a distinction of the different threshold that one may have crossed. How many thresholds are there? Well, they're probably infinite. You know, the more that the mind evolves, the more that the body evolves, we could potentially cross and meet different thresholds. So there is still no getting there. It's not a there. It's a it's a process of maintaining a mind that is above the threshold of active recognition to the point where eventually they can shift and alter their lens of perception at will. That's the that's the ultimate goal of this practice. The ultimate uh, threshold is to be able to shift your lens of perception at will. That is impossible below the threshold of active recognition. It is impossible without a mind that is creating significant gaps in the overall amount of thinking. It is impossible in a mind that isn't softening their uh, chains to the destroyers. Or limiting it to a specific area. You can see when an athlete changes their level of perception. Even just you sure. talking about the Tai Chi practitioner becoming the different animal, yeah. that is is a result of a practice that has principles that apply to everything we've talked about. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. that person doing that may not transfer that practice to everything. Their job or their relationships or their but they've they've limited and narrow area of being able to do that and doesn't don't necessarily apply it to everyday existence so there's a limit to it because of that exactly yes and also we understand the dynamics so that we can go beyond the limit of just one area of our existence of our life because we see these dynamics. A lot of people don't really know the dynamics that we're working with, even though it still applies to them, such as the life or death event that causes the shift in the lens of perception 
everything changes, their input output completely alters, they're able to survive. And then the lens of perception goes back to its habitual point. And then they don't remember anything. It's called state. Well, maybe not. Maybe they have a, a degree of, of appreciation that they didn't have before because they almost sure. died. And it does oh, change, sure. it, it can yeah. change the level of perception, but, but and that does apply across the board, but not, it, they don't recognize well, that it's an active thing right. that they can continue to build upon. Right. Yeah. The lens isn't necessarily aware of the lens. Yeah. That's why I call it impeccable self-awareness, which is one of the four corners or the four things that you can expect from the Egong practice, which is a very specific way of delivering bridge mindfulness, or I don't prefer the word mindfulness anymore. I'm kind of going away from that, but the bridge system. William, did you have anything to add there? I just see your mic. It's all good. All right. Any uh, final questions, comments, or concerns? I'm still waiting for the the name. Uh, if if I were to borrow it from like Don Juan, that is the definition of sorcery. Uh, he he talks about it way differently than I do, just because I don't know why. But um, I do see the parallels in some of the ideas and the way that I look at the lens of perception. Um, yeah, I can see that sorcery is uh, the evolution from uh, um, alchemy. Alchemy is already used. I already got that written down. Um, I start to talk about alchemy in a Tai Chi type of way when we have Shen, uh, Jing, and uh, Qi. Um, and I don't have to talk about it that way. I can also use different words, but we can talk about spirit, vital life force, and then I know that this isn't the way that it's presented in traditional Chinese medicine or in uh, the traditional way of looking at it. But I don't just limit it to like sexual essence. I kind of put all emotions in there because it's all uh, chemical. It's all electrochemical, not quite chi, not quite spirit. So it's that more chemical, mineral aspect of the human being, emotions, including sexual energy. And all. I kind of clump that all into one. But we do start to in a manner of speaking, we start to use the world around us to replenish, to charge, to transform. And that's when I start to talk about inner alchemy. And when I talk about inner alchemy, I'm talking about that picture of the human being and the energy flowing through it. I don't, I am not in the camp of sending energy or accumulating energy. I don't get into that camp because it violates other laws of transference of energy and thermodynamics. So I look at it more as the human being is, an, is a conduit. This practice helps us get out of the way. The energy starts to flow through the human being more, more uh, fluidly, that laminar flow where the heaven and the earth energy flowing through the human being, and we can transform that into more personal power. And then that affects the intention, uh, the desire, intention, and will, intelligence, knowledge, and wisdom triangles. So I do start to talk about that in the Egong training, and that's a form of inner alchemy. The reason that Don Juan called it sorcery, the definition of sorcery is somebody who can move uh, what we call the lens of perception. He calls it something different, but I I just can't really connect with his, in, his definitions and interpretations. It, it seems to be missing a lot of understanding the mind and cognition, which Carlos doesn't really talk about some of the aspects of human cognition, maybe because he didn't know about them as well. He was an anthropologist, not a psychologist. So I take the tricks of attention and things like that from that writing, but then I take other aspects from Thich Nhat Hanh, from the Dalai, Dalai Lama, uh, Eckhart Tolle, Alan Watts, uh, but some of this of what we're doing is not a reflection of any of that. And I, I do try to credit my sources, like uh, the mind arrives exactly where you put it. That came from Joshua Grant, where he told me when in Kung Fu, your, your body it arrives exactly where you intended it to be. Not because you thought about it, but because you willed it there through practice and through um consistency and everything else so i'm like oh i just do that with my mind that makes sense so i credit where that came from where that idea came from i try to do that as honestly as possible 
all right. Any questions, comments, concerns as we uh, break? So we'll be back again on Thursday. Thursday is open group study. You can uh, bring what you want, talk about what you want. Some of this group is um, they're getting to the point where they do need or they desire some formal practices. So I'm offering some of the Qigong, some of the Tai Chi stuff that I know. Uh, I, I can only share what I know and what I do. So um, if you really want to learn Tai Chi, there's probably a more qualified Tai Chi instructor. If you want to learn some stuff that is formal enough for you to apply it to your Qigong practice, I got you. I can show you some stuff. William, did you have anything to add there? Just checking. Uh, yeah, when I, I see really the... Have anything to add. I okay. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. I just want to, you know, say thank you again for, for uh, you know, the, the uh, sharing today and the information. And uh, a quick question, though. What is the... Dip, what, so the, the format on Thursday, I can't really generally make Thursdays, but I may be to listen in some days, so I could just listen in. But I just kind of wonder, what, what was the format on Thursdays uh, and the distinction between what we're doing here? Well, what we're doing here, I have 20 topics that I'm systematically going through. And on Thursday, if you guys don't have anything to talk about, we don't really talk too much. Uh, so it's really about the questions that the group brings, the topic that the group brings, and then it kind of shapes itself from there. So the group study is, I call it a group study because I'm practicing just like everybody else, but it's a chance to offer um, or to answer questions and to uh, explore tangents a little bit. I got you. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So more of an open forum type of thing. Yeah, I like what we're doing here. Um, and and not that I, I yeah, I, I I think I would appreciate both. I think for right now where I'm at, I think the 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 um, the way that you're presenting on Tuesday, it just uh, matches kind of it's it's. Um, yeah, I think it's an appropriate place for where I'm at in my, 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 my brain. Okay. I can't hear William. So if you are answering something, oh. you got to review what he asked. Yeah, the, the volume is really low, William. But he was he was basically just, he asked the difference between the Tuesday and the Thursday format. So the Tuesday format are the 20 specific topics, which will eventually end. We may go into Egon practice after the 20 topics. And then I'll start to deliver... The Egon practice for you, William, is kind of, uh, it could feel a little bit redundant because you have more than enough formal practices to apply. Um, however, the Egon practice will be specific points of attention to help get to the point where a person can alter their lens of perception at will. So it still be may, maybe it's still worth exploring and kind of halfway listening to or whatever. Um, and then I told William that Thursday is open study. That's just people come with questions, comments, concerns, and we kind of explore it. And uh, that's where we get to explore our tangents and it's okay. Um, and then William mentioned that the Tuesday format really works well for him and where he's at with his practice. And it will get, uh, the topics get really interesting as we start to go along because I do start to talk about the enemies of knowledge. And the first enemy of knowledge, I'm happy to deliver that one is distraction distraction from the present moment. Um, but then we get into the five destroyers and eventually uh, the final topic is, I have to look at my own notes. The final topic is the fifth gate of seeing. And that is uh, that luminous effect, the ignition of the luminous effect. I don't like the term self-sustaining because it's not, it doesn't sustain itself. Um, it can be sustained. It can be sustained ignition as a result of the practice. Uh, but we get into hunting power, the lens of perception, which is kind of what we talked about today, but we'll get even more in depth with it, which is the third gate. Dream walking, which is the feeling that all of your burdens in life aren't as important as you were making them out to be. Uh, they can still have, uh, it, you can care about it and you can give it the quality of your attention and you'll create something really good. That dynamic never changes, but the feeling of, uh, being trapped, like we need to do things, or this is so important. Like, what am I going to wear next Tuesday? My, you know, and people really get into these these weird things that they think are more important than they really are. That's because they're not using death as their advisor. Death will always tell you that this isn't that damn important. I promise. Like on your deathbed, you're never going to consider what you wore to that party last Tuesday or the stupid shit that you said when you were drunk last week. For example. <laughs> 
but yeah, so that's all I got for today. Um, Sunday we'll do more Qigong. So we will go into some movements. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do the Qigong forever. I'm just going to give you guys some shit to do and it will be in reflection to the Qigong. So I do recommend doing it because the points of attention that you do in the Qigong will be the same points of attention that you do in the Qigong. And I do have some differences in the way that I view Qi and Qigong than what may be shared with other people, such as uh, absorbing other people's energies. I don't look at it that way. Taking in fresh energy from the environment. There's a way that we can cleanse our lens of perception with the beauty and the freshness in the environment. But I don't really look at that as a literal transference of energy because then before you know it, We'll have Michael, who has much more chi than Donna, and he's setting things on fire with his hands, and Donna's just in this lowly, you can't even really feel chi category, and then I think that we're getting really weird, and I think that's all influences of the destroyers, and that's why they're there in the first place. So I don't really look at stuff like that. Uh, I look at things in the lens of um, non-manipulation, not trying to control or non-interference. So I don't even look at it as I'm manipulating and controlling my chi. I don't do that. Instead, I uh, use my intention wherever my attention goes and attention goes, chi follows. So I'm just looking to open things up so the intelligence of the body can do its thing. I'm not trying to manipulate anything, if that makes sense. It's a different way of looking at things. And I know that other Tai Chi, Qigong practitioners, they look at it differently. They want to absorb energy, send energy, heal from distances. Um, I'm in the camp of the body is fundamentally intelligent. Just get out of your own fucking way and let it do its thing. I can help you get out of the way with the practice. But I'll still say bring in fresh energy. <laughs> That's okay. Like the way I talk about it, I don't necessarily mean that literally, though. It uh, has an abstract quality to it, if you will. All right. So that's all I got. Donna wanted to hang out a little bit afterwards. So uh, you, you don't have to go home, but you do have to get out of here. Oh, I don't care if anybody stays. I just wanted to talk oh, to you okay. about something really quick. Okay. It's well, not private. I just didn't want to take up group time. Okay. All right. You. So I'll, I'll stop the recording.